some diced or sliced chilies. Right, I recommend something with a little bit of heat, but mild and sweet would also be fine. And that's it, we'll go ahead and cook those for a few more minutes until our onions and peppers just start to soften up. And basically everything movement. is looking, feeling, and tasting exactly Harrison, how we scout want. Ahead. We'll cover you. Which at this point, my really In fact, that little potato I was is was so crispy and so eventually it. And that's it, once we check for seasoning, we're ready to serve it. Because I'm doing an Indian thing, I'm gonna go ahead and finish with some chopped slots. But if you're not into that, go ahead and use some parsley with the tops of your green onions. Blackwell, report. That's it, our Bombay the breakfast potatoes are done. Right, 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 right off the fire, because I was done. And that, my friend, in taste, appearance, and texture, was just a magnificent All right, thanks to our The outside is very crispy, while the inside stayed very light and fluffy. And by the way, if you're afraid these are going to be too strongly flavored or too spicy, don't be. Okay, those spices we use definitely come through, but it is much more subtle than you would think. Okay, I am a fairly traditional eater, especially when it comes to breakfast. So for me, these really do have to taste and feel and appear like home fries. And notwithstanding the appearance and all that stuff we put in, these really do. And of course, once you have a platter of Bombay breakfast potatoes, you're just a poached egg away from a Bombay breakfast potato bowl, which I'm doing here, garnished with a little shake of kind plus a completely unnecessary sprig of cilantro, which basically just wilted on the potato. So I really should have put that on the egg, and I would have if I knew anything about food stock. But anyway, I quickly forgot about that, because I was just about to take these incredible potatoes Major, the and dunk them into a glorious runny yolk poached egg, which okay. is always an amazing experience. And it really is amazing with just a few extra ingredients, how we can take something that's generally not very exciting, or especially memorable, and turn it into something that's still familiar, yet much, much more interesting. And if you'll excuse me for one second, I seriously need to use it, because it's still bugging me. But anyway, that aside, I loved absolutely everything about this. So whether you're going to go ahead and Indian spice these up or not, or you're just going to use this video as a reminder for how to make beautiful, crispy, crusty home fried potatoes, Either way, I really do hope you give these a try soon. So head over to Fujitsu.com for all the ingredients and ask them all for that. Here's all we need. Trust to get that landing beacon online. Hello, this is Chef John from FoodDistry.com with Lazy Pork Dumpling. That's right, making the dough and filling for a dumpling is pretty fast and easy. But the thing that takes a little bit of time and effort is all the shaping and folding and crimping and bleeding that goes into making a nice looking dumpling. Which is why I'm very excited to show you a method for making dumplings much faster and easier. And while these might not be as pretty, thanks to the amazing taste and texture, the last thing you're going to be thinking about while you're eating these is what they look like. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with our lazy dough, which is going to be made with nothing more than all-purpose flour, a big pinch of salt, and some warm water. And what I like to do first is give this a mix with a normally sized right. wheat oh, until it all comes together into a very, very sticky dough ball. Right, very sticky, as in too sticky to me. But that is intentional, because what we'll do when it looks like this is get rid of this bit Go ahead and transfer in some more food. At which point we'll switch to our hand and start kneading this. And we will keep kneading, adding more flour if necessary, until we have a soft and supple, but not sticky dough. And the beauty of this method is that we're Good not work, gonna get Marie. stuck with a too dry Harrison, dough. Find the nearest okay, it's always way easier to need a little more flour in than try to add some water later. So we generally wanna start with something that's too sticky, and then we can work in some more flour a few tablespoons at a time until it's perfect. And that's it, once we have achieved a dough that's soft but not sticky, we'll go ahead and wrap that with plastic, and then we'll just let it rest out at room temp for about a minute. And yes, of course, if you're gonna make this ahead, you can leave it in the fridge, no problem. And that's it, once our lazy dough's done, we can move on to our lazy dough. We're gonna start with some brown pork, to which we will add a whole bunch of crushed garlic, as well as some freshly grated ginger, followed by a whole bunch of sliced green onion, as well as their little cousin, freshly sliced chopped. By the way, if you get sick a lot, try to eat more garlic and types of onions. They really are helpful. 
But anyway, we'll go ahead and season this up with some kosher salt, as well as a whole bunch of freshly ground black pepper. And since I gave Kayan the day off, we're gonna go with some Korean chili sauce. That is going to be a Mix this until it's just the Roger, sir. You may have heard me say before, the reason I like the pork is so when you're here with our hot dog, you will actually warm up the pork. And that's it. Once our mix has been properly forked, we'll go ahead and throw a piece of plastic over it. And toss it in the fridge until we're ready. And not just to give it time for those flavors to work. But it's almost always the case that the colder ground meat is, the easier it is to work with. So we'll pop that in the oven. Danger. Hold here. And the only other prep we can do would be to flavor our chicken broth if we're going to flavor it at all. But I definitely am. With some vinegar and a little bit of soy sauce. As well as a nice big pinch of those pretty chili flavors. I think this chicken broth, since we can just use regular chicken broth. Anyway, I'll just install that. The point is here is you can put anything you want in this And you are after all the slop. You're lazy dumping. And if we want, we can use this right away. But if we're going to make them later, just go ahead and pop that in the fridge as well. And that's it. Assuming we are ready to roll, we'll go ahead and pull out our dough. And I'm going to take about one quarter of what we made. And on a floured surface, I'm going to kind of roll that out until it's about the thickness of my thumb. Somehow, some way, using just enough flour so it doesn't stick, we want to roll this out into a band about three inches long, however long that is. Okay, let's say like 15, 16 inches. And then one kind of semi-important thing here. Once we have that about the size of the go ahead and dust the surface with flour and then flip it over so that we're pretty sure the surface underneath is not going to stick once we do it. Plus, now the side that's probably a little stickier is facing up which is going to be an advantage when we move to the next step. But to hedge our bets, after we do a little bit of fine tuning, we'll go ahead and take some nice fresh cold water, plus one clean fingertip, and we'll go ahead and very lightly moisten this up. And we don't want to put too much on. Right, we don't want it wet. We just want to do a little bit Give it up, man. And then Rusty, once that's been accomplished, using the exact same water, we will moisten our fingers, and then use them to transfer on some cold right down the middle of our bed. Wet fingers and hands do not stick to meat. So a little bit of moisture on them is going to make this a lot easier. And then once we've transferred the meat on, and evened it out again to about the thickness of our thumb, we will go ahead and fold that dough over along the whole dough. And as we do, we'll be sure to press it down, which because our dough is kind of sticky, should seal fairly easily. And the whole strategy behind this lazy dumpling method is that instead of forming and shaping and crimping and cleaning and sticking in the big we're basically just going to make it easier and then we'll dive that up Which again, while not as aesthetically pleasing, is way, way faster and easier. And then what we can do once that's been completed, if we want, is take our bench strip, or maybe a pizza piece, and go ahead and trim off any of the extra. Which, by the way, if you don't mind a little extra dough in your dump, it's totally unnecessary. But basically, I just want the minimum amount of dough needed to hold it on. And then what we'll do before we divide it is dust on a little more flour and then roll the entire thing so the seam's on the side. And that's it. One done, the giant pocket is ready to be divided into lots of little things, which I'm going to do with the well-floured side of my hand, which I will be pressing down very firmly all the way to the tip. And for whatever reason, I started by dividing two, and then into four, and then into eight, and eventually sixteen. Although in hindsight, it probably would have been even better to start at one end. And then simply karate chop these all the way to the end. But anyway, I have never done Especially since, as you could probably notice, I was not overly concerned with getting all these perfect food. Truth be told, once these are cooked, a little variation in size is not going to be very good. So I simply embraced their diversity, and I continued on to the last step, which would be to cut these apart with a bench scraper or pizza cutter or, or a spatula, or whatever tool you'll think will get this done. And by the way, do not worry if your dough does not seal on the edges. That's totally fine. Okay, so please don't worry about trying to pinch the dough on the ends together. It will not be a problem. That's it. I went ahead and transferred those on. This time, the top is in the fridge and we're ready to cook. But I'm actually going to go ahead and cook up a soda. And what I'm going to do is place those seam side up 
and a little bit of oil in a pan of oil. And while you can just eat these or cook these in boiling water, I think by browning and caramelizing a little bit in the oil first, it would get a much more interesting texture and texture. Okay, so we're sort of borrowing from the old, old hot chicken. So I gave that first side a bottom of the went ahead and flipped it At which point it's time to pour in our flavored and or non-flavored chicken. Once that's been transferred in, we will cover this and let it boil on high for about three minutes or so, or until these are cooked. Okay, that's really going to depend on how big you make it. So if yours are bigger and you have to give them an extra minute, go ahead. That is just you. Up an IR lens for you. But anyway, <laughs> mine were done in about three minutes. Only be able to use Considering how fast and lazily and ununiform I made them, I thought they looked really good. So I went ahead and pulled those off and transferred them into a shallow bowl. And then, of course, my flavor. And by the way, when you do this at home, just go ahead and pour in all the broth. Okay, because it was going to take some pictures of the perfect level. So I held back about three tables. Because I have to admit, it's pretty frustrating. So you go ahead and go harder. Are and I went ahead and finished mine up with a little more cherry flakes Short tunnels gained and a little scattering of those green onion parts I cut on the bottom. With a security system and, and that's it, my lazy pork dumpling is done. The so I grabbed the spoon and went in for it. And even though these are made with a completely different metal, the final result was an easy experience very similar to the classic spoon. Which, if you're not familiar, is a gorgeous pork dumpling. It actually contains meat and gelatinized broth inside. So that when you steam them, it liquefies. You take a bite not only because you get all that luscious broth and soy sauce. Those are usually served with a little bit of soy sauce. As I was taking spoonfuls of it, it really was a remarkable similar. Plus, these are a little bit because you can really use a very certain amount of soy sauce. So, every single person has ever used it. So, I didn't even set out to eat it. But somehow, someway, I accidentally ended up. And even though it's just something that's not right, I actually think that the caramelization here on the dough sort of helped me get that. So, long as the audience can remember what the food is, it really did remind me of you and the world's most incredible. And by the way, it hurts me. And anyway, that's it. And I'm calling lazy pork dumpling. With these things lacking visual beauty and gorgeous old dishes, they more than make up for by tasting your cat. Which is why I really do hope you give them a try soon. So head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as usual. And as always, enjoy. Chef John from foodwishes.com. Yorkshire pudding. That's right, it's a town for the high level. It's a little bit of when I came to talk about it. Mostly because it wasn't pudding. But then I learned how the British people call almost everything pudding, including sometimes even actual pudding. But anyway, while not the sweet dessert it might sound like, the savory taste of cooked and rendered beef fat is incredibly delicious and super simple to make. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with a very good dish. We'll begin with four larges. What we'll do here is toss in a nice big pinch of salt. And just be generous and so cool until we have something that's light in color and very fluffy. Hopefully looking a little something like this. It and then what we'll do once that's been accomplished is stop and add our and flour. Right. Just regular all-purpose flour. Plus some whole milk. And then we will continue this until the mixture is extremely smooth. And that's you definitely use a blender for this. But then you have to But you don't get the exercise from stirring that. Which according to my calculations right, will burn as many calories as one of these Yorkshire puddings. Although I should mention I'm basing that on no fat or actual studies. What's going on, Major? But simply on the Which apparently these days is all But either way. Like I said, we're going to mix this into our survivors in the their situation. And what you should be ending up with is a very, very thin thing that will just barely coat the back. By the way, and that's it. Once our batter is done, we can go ahead and transfer that to some kind of portable container. At which point, we have a little bit of controversy. 
Okay, some folks say you can use this straight away, while others insist it must be refrigerated before you use it, which I think is probably not a bad idea. Although truth be told, I have tried it both ways and didn't notice a huge difference. And then once that's done, we can move on to the next one, which is to cook a primer or any kind of fatty beef for that matter. Since traditionally it's these buttons in which we cook our Yorkshire pudding. And what I did was strain that into a bowl. And once refrigerated, it's gonna look like this. All right, very light in color and quite hard and firm. And if we're not using it fresh right after we roast our beef, what we'll have to do is go ahead and warm this up, which I did in the microwave, to get it back to its liquefied form. At which point we can use that in whatever pan we're gonna use for. Like we don't have enough problems which for me already. is just gonna be we this basic bug running around somewhere on level 12. And how much God exactly depends race. on who you talk to. All right, some people think like a teaspoon's fine, while others will fill this like a quarter of the way up. All right, personally, I go with about a tablespoon, but suit yourself. I mean, you are after all the bojo, which way to go. But I will say that the more fat you use, the more flavorful you have. have the results. Not to mention the exteriors are going to get a little crispier. And then besides just spooning some of that in, we will also take our finger and grease the sides of the house as well. Which reminds me, try to use a nonstick muffin pan for this. Okay, I actually don't have one, and I'm not sure why. But the nonstick are a little crispy, as these can tend to stick a little bit at the bottom. Although it's usually not too much, it's fairly easily dry. But I thought I'd mention that it's a safety on And then what we'll do as soon as those are greased is go ahead and transfer those into the center of a 400 degree oven for about 10 to 15 minutes. Or until our rendered beef is No, we didn't forget to put the batter in. Right, one of the secrets to Yorkshire pudding is to add the batter into the really hot fire. So as soon as that comes out, we'll go ahead and pour our batter in. As possible, which is why I'm not going to have time to change the camera. And we're going to fill these just about past halfway. And then once those are filled, we'll go ahead and add whatever else we have left and distribute it here and there wherever we think it's needed. But don't take too long, like I'm doing here, because we really do want to get these back in the oven as soon as possible, which is the last and final step. So once those are set, we'll go ahead and transfer those back into the center of our 400 for about 25 minutes or so, or until beautifully browned and extremely dry. At which point we will immediately take a knife and poke a hole in the top of each one to release it's the an animal storage. Okay, some the of them are going to form a natural vent, but for the ones we don't, we will make sure we poke a hole to release the stuff. Otherwise, what will happen is these tools is a vacuum hole, and they will kind of get stuck in and stuck in. Which they will sort of anyway, but by poking that hole and releasing the steam, they will not collapse as much. And that's it, we're going to want to serve these as soon as we can. I'll go ahead and take one of the smaller, less impressive ones. Right? They did, as predicted, stick a little bit at the bottom. And by the way, if you use a spoon, you can get that loose in like two seconds. But for my go ahead and use the point of a small knife. But anyway, I got it loose and tore in for a tip. And these really do have such an interesting texture, since the outside is kind of crusty and crispy, while the inside stays more tender and custardy. And yes, this was way too hot to eat, but I did win. And you really That's do want to serve these as fast you. as you can. The they traditionally right next to your meat, smothered in whatever gravy or sauce you want. Which, because I'm doing this on a different day, I did not have, but wish I had. But anyway, I went ahead and tossed those in a basket, when they like someone to investigate. Of course, placing the best person in the and went in for another because even plain these are very, very good. That so that is your basic Yorkshire pudding cooking in the Unfortunately, it also But if you want, you can do the exact same procedure. Use a larger popover pan like this, with twice as much batter, which will give us the same product, only much larger and more impressive looking. So if you do have one of these popover pans, that's a great way to get it. Oh, and by the way, just for fun, I ended up cooking one more batch in the popover pan, but I did not poke the holes to release the steam. And as you can see, after just a few minutes, that vacuum created inside while these cool pulls everything inward into a much denser, more compact. Take the elevator up. It's sort of similar, I guess, to what happens in space with a black hole, or as they call it in Britain, black pudding. But anyway, just a little bonus footage in case that happens to you. And it really won't affect the flavor. You'll just lose that beautiful cavity inside. Speaking of which, if you have any of these things left over, Check the especially the bigger version, there's an emergency they are perfect the to open up and fill with some kind of beautiful salad. In my case, some cubed up leftover primer, 
that I dressed with some mayonnaise and sour cream and horseradish and chive and black pepper and a little pinch of salt. And there was one other thing. Oh yeah, touch it. Went ahead and finished that off with a little black pepper. And that, my friends, is just a magnificent sandwich like that. Nice sandwich. But anyway, that's it. My take on Yorkshire bird. Whether you're working on it or not, give these a try with the render fan. Give them to somebody else. Still waiting for you. Give these a try soon. Head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more for that. And as always, enjoy. Chef John from foodwishes.com with dry aged prime rib. That's right, I dry aged a prime rib for over 40 days and 40 nights, and I could hardly believe what happened. Most were surprising, a little bit confusing, but very interesting. But anyway, I don't want to say Although I will say, if you've ever thought about dry aging your own prime rib, you really should watch this video first. So, with that, let's go ahead and get started. And the first no, thing you're going to need, of course, is a primer. Once we make the trade, I'll and this help you beautiful specimen friends. weighed in at about 10 pounds. And not only do we want to make sure there's still a fair amount of fat on top, but we definitely also want to make sure we use a prime rib that has the bones attached. And speaking of attached, I'm going to go ahead and detach whatever that is right there. All right, looks like the elevators are ready. Before we put this on our dryer, is go ahead and quickly clean the surface with a little bit of salted water. Okay, I just dissolved like a spoon of salt in a cup of water. We will use that to wipe down the surface. Okay, some people like to rinse this under running water and then pat it dry. And then others wash it. But I think this quick Damn wipe it. down with a saline solution is more than that. And panel? that's it. Besides some clean beef, the only other thing we're going to need here is some kind of tray and rack to put it on. You've got to get out of there. Which for me will just be a sheet pan with this roasting rack. And then before we rack our beef, I'm going to put some salt down on the tray first. Okay, some regular sea salt plus some, some pink Himalayan salt. The people that the say that that will help control the dreams of the end of your life. Whatever that is. But you know what? It looks cool. It feels right. Plus, the best dry aged beef I've ever had was in Chicago. And was actually made for the food that was lined with this beef. But anyway, you just have to You are after all the very good of your dry aged beef. I really don't think there's going to be that much of a fact on whether the bacteria in your refrigerator is staying alive. And that's it. Once we have our beef panda, we can head to our hopefully dedicated fridge. Okay, I'm doing this in my empty spare fridge in the garage. It really will make this whole operation a lot easier than trying to do it regularly. If you're going to be opening and closing the fridge, back across the skyway. what we'll do is leave it in from anywhere between 30 and 45 days. The wind's pretty strong out there. Okay, they say in less than 30 days, not much happens. And after 45 days, maybe it's too much. By the way, the temperature of your fridge is Try not to look down. Okay, we really want to maintain a temperature between 34 and 38 degrees. There should be so that I wasn't there. guessing, I used this probe to mop that I have dangling somewhere near the meat in the middle of the fridge. And this is actually what my prime rib looked like after two weeks of aging. All right, it was getting dark, it was getting dry. But happily, there was nothing dangerous looking for Oh, and I should mention, a lot of people recommend you have a fan in your fridge. But I don't have a fridge fan. Or a fan to put in my fridge. And that didn't seem to cause any problems. But anyway, that's what it looked like after two weeks. And this is what it looked like after six weeks, when I finally pulled it out. And it was even darker and even drier. And it had a very subtle, pleasantly funky smell. So I was feeling pretty good. Except I did not want to do what is traditionally the next step. And that would be trimming all the hard dry surface off until we get down to that nice soft red. Right, I was okay trimming off a little bit of the fat. Not to eat all that. Anymore. But I really did not want to trim any of the meat. I mean, sure, it was super hot and almost brown. But I thought that might be the Drop best place to go. Although I was thinking, Drop is that safe to eat? So I decided to do an experiment. Okay, I was going to slice a little piece off the side so that I could cook it and test it. Okay, sure, I'm a chef, but I'm also a horribly undereducated scientist. 
so I cut a little piece off the end that was mostly fat. And it was funny, even though it was dark, the meat underneath really did feel like fresh meat. Whereas the other side felt like a And anyway, like I said, I went ahead and trimmed that up. And then seasoned it with a little bit of salt. After which I quickly pan fried. And what I was thinking was I would eat this one. And if I didn't get horribly ill, I would not be to get out of my And yes, I have to admit, as I cut into this, I was a little bit scared. Not every day you eat a piece of medium rare attached to black heart. And if you're wondering what this tasted like, I'm not going to tell you. Okay, we're going to save the flavor review for the end. But texturally, I determined it was very odd. And I'm happy to report I survived this experience with no adverse effects at all. So I did go back to trim off a little bit of the fat in any areas I thought were even remotely suspicious of. But as you will see from my pile of scraps, I really didn't trim off any of the meat at all. Which is good, because this thing lost like two pounds of weight during the dry aging process. We've got $20 a pound, and I lost $40 a pound. And uh, like I said, I had to do the minimum of the Let's do that. We'll go ahead and spray the surface with water so that the salt is getting out. Okay, otherwise that surface is so dry and slick, the salt really is not going to hold out. So I gave that a spray all of it. We're very, very generous with this with kosher salt. Okay, this okay, is, is a big hunt. So you almost can't put too much salt on it. And that's it. Once we have that surface covered with salt, finally we have And one or two more days. I do want to give this well, some of that salt from the So I went ahead and popped my new spray for 24. About 48 hours is probably even better. At which point we can throw it back out. And yes, finally we can cook in a couple of hours. I don't want to put a roast new steak into the oven. So we'll just leave that on the countertop, covered up in case there's any curious critters flying around. And we'll let it sit there warm enough a little. At which point, finally, no more sykes. We're gonna put this in the oven. And because I'm gonna use a traditional roasting oven, I'm gonna use this probe thermometer so we get it perfect. And of course, we wanna place that right in the center. And then what we're gonna do here is use the old 500, 300 knife, which means we sear this in a really hot 500 degree oven for 20 minutes, and then reduce our heat down to 30 degrees so it's cooked to our liking. Which for me was supposed to be about 125 to 130 internal temp. But funny story, the probe thermometer I used could not take the 500 degree temperature, and unbeknownst to me, stop working. But luckily, I figured that out just in the nick of time. And even though this went up to more like 135, it's still a good So you probably don't want to stick in your mouth until you're having enough to come back. But anyway, all of you I went ahead and let that rest for about 30 minutes before the time. By the way, it's right there. I do not pull these right out of the oven. It's great. Close to meat. It was still absolutely gorgeous and juicy, and still beautifully thin. And I could not wait to grab a fork and knife and start eating. And by eating, I knew animals. So I went ahead and plated up a giant pork. Alright, usually it's one bone for two porks, but not for me to. And because I wanted to focus on the flavor, I did not serve this with any fancy sauce. Although I do have something of a horseradish pepper. So I did serve a little bit of horseradish cream on the side for the later bite. But anyway, I went ahead and dug in, and it really was incredible. Just extremely juicy and tender. I absolutely love everything about it except the taste. Or lack thereof. And what I mean by this is that this taste is just like really good meat. But it really didn't have any of that fun that, that one would expect after seconds. dry eating and deep for six hours. Okay, for me, that really is the simple most important reason. So while this really was delicious, I cannot honestly say it tasted that much different than just a regular old prime rib we threw in the oven. And I even tried that outer crust by itself, because that should have a stronger flavor, but it didn't. Now having said that, I do think the aging helped make this a little more tender. And because we lost two pounds of weight, I do think the flavor concentrates a little more, but it just concentrated that regular beefy flavor, and not that kind of extra flavorful cheesy funkiness I really want. And if I'm going to wait for six weeks and basically lose $40 worth of product through evaporation, is something that's a little more tender and a little more beefy worth it. And I even tried a little bit of extra salt to see if that would bring it out. 
way downstairs. So to summarize, I really don't. I mean, I guess if you have the budget and the extra fridge, you should like try. Maybe there's a little bit of Okay, maybe we should have left it longer. But I do have to say the results were really good. So I can't officially say I really think what the business is bad. But what I will still say is head over to foodwishes.com for all the ingredient amounts and more info as it's all I love any technique that makes me forget I'm eating boneless, skinless chicken breasts. Encrusting it with nuts is one of those techniques. Except these type of recipes usually have two big problems. One is they're almost always too sweet. And also, as soon as you cut in, all the nuts fall off the surface. And instead of a nut crust, you end up with a nut crumble. But with the method I'm about to show you, we've addressed both those problems with the same solution. So with that, let's go ahead and get started with what I'm calling the nut glue which will start with a whole bunch of freshly crushed garlic. And as any prep cook will tell you, as it dries, there is very few things as sticky as garlic. You've got to get out of there and to that, we will add some Dijon mustard for some acidity and tangy. Be just up ahead. And then last but not least, some freshly picked and lightly and chopped thyme. Right. Once that's in, we'll go ahead and give this a stir. Oh God, get and out I love the earth. thyme here because it's kind of citrusy and very subtly resinous, which I think is going to pair perfectly with the richness of the water. But of course, if you uh, want to use another herb, go uh, ahead. I mean, you are after all the loosey root of your nut glue. Oh, and speaking of kills, you, if you're going to make this for guests, make sure none of them have a tree nut allergy. Uh, that will definitely put a damper on it. But anyway, we'll go ahead and mix that up and set it aside while we move on to prep our chicken bread. And by prep, I simply mean generously season on both sides. And today, I'll be using a mixture of kosher salt, freshly ground black pepper, and cayenne. Oh, and as you might have noticed, these chicken breasts did not have the fillets or tenderloins attached. Which really doesn't make that big of a difference, except if yours do, it's going to take a little longer to cook. And I actually prefer it that way. But this will work fine with or without. And sure, if you wanted to, you could just season the nut glue. But I think by seasoning the meat directly, we have a little more control. And a better feel for how much we're putting on. And that's it. One season will go ahead and spread over our mustard and garlic mixture. And if I wasn't filming this, I probably would have used my hand. But the spoon is fine as long as you get full coverage. Okay, so make sure you spread that all over. At which point, we're going to go ahead and pop that in the fridge until we're ready. By the way, you can do this step hours ahead if you want, or even overnight probably, even though I've never tried it. And then the only other thing we're going to have to do here is chop some walnuts. And for that, today I'll be using something called a mess. Well, this is not really an It's actually probably a little bit slower than you It does look good. But since both hands are on the knife, that leaves exactly zero hands to get cut. Oh, and if you're thinking, that yellow will also be stuck. Yes, it does. Before I talk to you, and for the record, she was a big and very early inspiration for the music. But anyway, one way or another, we're going to chop those knots fairly fine. And then once that's been completed, we'll go ahead and pull our chicken out of the fridge and begin to walnut the surface, pressing very firmly as we do. And it's not just like we're tossing out one handful and patting them down. All right, we're tossing some on, we're patting them down, we're tossing more on, we're patting them down. All right, doing that to both sides of it. And not just the surfaces. We've got to make sure we get the sides. And I have no idea why I'm using such a small plate here. Since I didn't want this to appear hard to I can contact your ship. But anyway, we will coat those generously on both sides. And even though at this point it might not seem like those are stuck on very well, and that they might easily fall off, as you'll see, because as our mustard and garlic nuts are dry, it actually gets really sticky, and it's going to hold on to our nuts very firmly. Harrison, if that is, we give it enough time to dry. This is why once these chicken breasts are coated very generously on both sides, we're going to transfer this back into the fridge uncovered I'm for at least an hour. Now. Okay, try to give it two or three hours if you can. That is what's going to give our food enough time to get it. So 
Yeah. Did pop mine in the fridge for about an hour. At which point we can go ahead and pull them out and pan them. Before we transfer those in, we do want a generous drizzling of olive oil in the bottom. Well, if you have leftover nuts, you don't have to throw them away. You can actually use them to garnish your salad, but you do need to roast them since they've been touching rock So if you're already eating them, make sure you cook them. And what we'll do once those have been placed in, is go ahead and sprinkle a little bit of salt over the top. As well as we'll finish off with a roll of thorough cooking. That's it. Walnut crusted chicken is now ready to transfer to the assembly. 375 degree oven for about 25 minutes. While everything is cooked, now walnuts are white. If everything goes according to plan, it should look a little something like this. And then what we're going to want to do as soon as these come out is transfer those onto a plate to rest for about 5 minutes. While we use our pan to make a pan sauce, which as you may know, are exactly where pan sauces are made. So what we'll do is place that over high heat, and we'll add a little bit of chicken stock or broth, or if times are tough, a little bit of water, as well as a spoon of grease, and then just a little touch of honey for some sweetness to balance out the sharpness of the mustard. And we will go ahead and stir that all together, and then bring it up to a boil on high heat. Of course, being very careful not to burn ourselves out again. Since this came right out of the oven. Okay, so make sure you keep a towel in your hand and or on the hand. And then all we're going to do is let this boil. This is an old survey site. They buried it after the POC went down. These ruins are ancient. And that's Tens it. We're going to be left with a very nice pan sauce orange. They're powered by geothermal energy using incredibly sophisticated reactors. By the way, I went ahead and we haven't even begun to understand this technology. We know for sure really that don't. the bugs aren't indigenous to this planet. But either way, we'll go ahead and spin that around or on our chicken. I guess they ran into purple. That's it, our walnut crusted chicken with honey mustard pan sauce is ready to enjoy. So let me grab a fork and knife and dig it. And yes, once again, I've somehow managed to have the smaller, skinnier end instead of the beautiful fat end facing over. So I'll be starting with it. But you know what? It did not matter. What is that, my friend? It's just an amazingly delicious bite of food. Okay, above and beyond its great taste and texture, that crust really helps keep the chicken in. Even if you happen to make it with the Light pork Just to clear out whatever Even if you cook that far, Like I said earlier, the tend to be very, very sweet. But thanks to our mustardy, garlicky nuts, this is very savory. Not at all. But a little bit of natural sweetness kind of comes out. But that's about it. This is why, by the way, that little bit of honey in our pan sauce works so well. And maybe the most impressive compliment I've is that at no time while it was a human, was I think this is boneless. One more to go. It never occurred to me. This really does eat like something off the bone covered in bed. So to some extent, I love everything about this text, which is why I really do hope you give it a try soon. So head over to humanshoes.com. There's all we That's right, this delicious stew only takes five minutes to cook. Once, of course, everything's sliced and diced and prepped, and the base to our stew is made. But the point is, it still cooks very quickly. And it's one of my favorite all time techniques if you like seafood. And if you don't like seafood, it's usually because you didn't have a lot of it growing up. But as the wise man once said, it is never too late to have a happy childhood, especially when it comes to food. So, with that, let's go ahead and get started with our dough. For me, it's going to be a whole bunch of sliced garlic. Plus some fresh fat, which hopefully when you buy it, you can buy it. What we'll do to prep it is go ahead and cut this off over the top of it. And then I'm going to cut this right down the middle, because I'm only going to use half for this. I'm going to save half to shave it to the salad. Slice of 
to fairly thin people. And by the way, don't be a hero when you get towards the end. Okay, when it gets too small to slice, just get your fingers out of it. Just finish off with a little chop. And then once that's set, we'll go ahead and move on to our quick turn. Which for me is going to be some cat summer dog. Because I had some to do with it. But I'll And I'll do that for a little Go ahead and add Well, after that, or even better, more time, those both 